If you notice I'm shaking, it's not because I'm nervous, it's because it's quite cold here. Um, oh, okay. So today I'm here to talk to you a bit about JavaScript fatigue and what we can learn with it. So my Twitter and GitHub handles are up there. If you want to send me questions or anything, just go for it. And well, recently uh, I've been maintaining Chai.js and Sino.js. Uh, who here uses it? Please raise your hands if you use any of them. Cool. Um, so one of the very the most recurring th recurring themes in our community is JavaScript fatigue, right? Which is the feeling of being overwhelmed with all the modules, with all the things, all the tools we gotta use in our ecosystem. And well, I decided to write a blog post about it a few months ago, and fortunately, it got to the first place on Hack News, and it was very, very controversial. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, I'm guilty. Um, so basically, I'm going to start this talk with something most colleges don't teach you. And please don't get me wrong, I think college is great. Uh, I think college is awesome. But I just think it likes a very important subject, which is called Realities of Industry 101. So the first truth here is that software solves business problems. You know, most software out there is boring, don't have any like high performance constraints, doesn't deal with huge amounts of data. You know, it, most people don't have that big data they <laughs> talk about. So keep in mind that you're not paid to write code. You're paid to solve problems. And actually, the less code you write to solve those, that, those problems, the better. If you can solve a problem in one line of code, that's a lot better than solving it in 100, right? And that's because technology is not a go. Writing bug-free software is not a go. Using hipster frameworks is not a go. You can wear bow ties instead, it's much better. Um, using uh, hipster frameworks, hipster programming language is not a go, and even writing beautiful code is not a go. And that's because ghost versus revenue is the only thing that matters. We don't write bug-free software because our clients don't like bug-free software. Because, in fact, if they wanted bugs, we could write them bugs all day. And if you have ever experienced a bug becoming a feature, you know what I'm talking about. You won't correct that just because you value correctness. Because in the end, all that matters is less cost and more revenue. And you also don't write beautiful code just because it pleases us programmers to have beautiful code. We write beautiful code because in the end, it makes us more productive. So all these things, you know, like launching rockets into space, self-driving cars, robots, AI, like I'm sure everyone thinks this is pretty cool, but it happens for a reason. It happens because people have economic interests behind it. Just, as, just like people have interest, economic, uh, like economic interests behind software. And maybe I should not even call this section realities of Industry 101. Maybe I should just call it realities of capitalism 101. So if all that matters is cost versus revenue, maybe we should start paying more attention to other aspects of software development, such as the importance of having good design. So in 75, Bowen has found out that out of all software he was studying, only 36% of errors came from coding, while 64% came from design. In the NASA Apollo project itself, 73% of all errors were design errors. And having clear requirements, having good design is very important because without requirements or design, programming is just the art of adding bugs to an empty text file. <laughs> and well, if you also remember that cost versus revenue is all that matters, you will notice how important the next quote is because good design adds value faster than it adds cost. So all these things, you know, ChaiJS, Babel, Mocha, React, Webpack, all these things, they exist to solve problems. Not because just someone thought it was cool to write one of these huge things, right? So we must know when to use them and why we're using them. Because if we don't, then JS fatigue happens. JS fatigue happens when people use tools they don't need to solve problems they don't have. And most of the time they do that because of trying to do premature optimization, which, according to Donald Nath, is the root of all evil. So why would you add unnecessary complexity to your software if you're not solving a problem? In the end, you're just trying to solve problems to increase your revenue and decrease your costs, right? And you should not add 
complexity to your software if you're not solving problems. The purpose of software engineering is to control complexity, not to create it. And the greatest performance improvement of all is when a system goes from not working to working. And if something does not work at all, it doesn't matter how fast it does not work, right? So if you remember this, that's driven development, I think we should apply this to everything we do. And I'm not just talking about writing tests and then writing code, that's, that's not it. What I'm trying to, to tell you is that you should take small steps, you should find problems before trying to solve things, right? So the more confident you feel, the bigger are your steps. And that's what TDD is all about. It's about finding problems and then solving them. So by taking smaller steps, you reduce the scope of the decisions you gotta make. And with less decisions, you also have less choices. And this is important because it decreases analysis paralysis. Uh, and analysis paralysis is what happens when you, for example, open Netflix, right? So you spend like three hours deciding what you're gonna watch and in the end you watch nothing. That's because you got too many choices. And we all know that more choices mean less satisfaction. Who here agrees with that? Okay, you should all get subscription boxes, right? You, you won't get disappointed. So Barry Schwartz says in his book that as the number of options increase, the costs in time and effort of getting information needed to make a good choice also increases. And that's because our willpower is limited, right? The more decisions we gotta take a day, well, the more tired our willpower gets. Our willpower is just like a muscle. And this study shows it quite well. So in here we have a graph showing the percentage of several decisions you just gave uh, and the time of the day in the x-axis. Uh, as you can see, as the day starts, they have a 65% chance of giving favorable decisions. And as lunchtime approaches, well, that drops steadily to zero. And after lunchtime, it goes all the way back up to 65%. The same thing happens again when it approaches like their, like, I don't know, afternoon break or something. And then it goes all the way up to 65%. So our willpower is just like a muscle. The more you use it, the more tired it gets. And what do we learn with this? Well, two things. First one, if you commit a crime, make sure the first one to go to trial that day. And the second one is that we might not be JavaScript fatigue. Maybe we're just decision fatigue. So let's talk a bit about JavaScript, about our ecosystem specifically. I think there's no better way of showing people how big the JavaScript environment is without showing them uh, a bunch of impressive numbers. This graph is very impressive. As you can see, NPM has more than doubled any other package repos out there. We have right now 520,000 packages on NPM. That's an average of, of 494 packages a day. And in the Netherlands, about 465 people are born a day. So we need to have more babies to test those NPM packages. Um, the NPM registry traffic has gone 1,000 times in the last five years. That's 100,000% growth since 2012. But how did that happen? Well, transpilers, they exist for a reason. They exist because they're trying to solve a problem, right? So we need Babel because browsers, like they, they give us different levels of support for different features on JavaScript, and that's why we need Babel. Babel also allows us to have like DSLs, which makes us a lot more productive. So in the end, these things, they're trying to solve problems. Module bundlers, they also happened because we needed a way of modularizing our code, right? We didn't have that in JavaScript. If you, if you write JavaScript for a long time, you remember all those script tags, which were, which were very tedious, very verbose, very error prone. And then uh, RequireJS uh, require and AMG tried to solve that. But, well, they didn't really go that well, and then Node.js came with its uh, common JS imports, and Browserify and Webpack tried to make that the standard for modularizing code also for the browser. Frontend frameworks, they exist to make us think less about manipulating the DOM as the logic of our application like moves about like when it changes. So basically, they just provide us good abstractions. 
and abstractions are necessary to reduce the cognitive load of how things work so that you can focus on creating. And if you notice, all the, like, which thing all of these technologies have in common is that they exist because the web platform moves too fast. Standards don't move fast enough. So by having solutions made by people, for people, by developers, for developers, we have better natural selection. Because when things thrive, when things go well, when things really solve people's problems, well, then those things get more contributors, they move faster, so people start using them more, and they might even become native one day. So we have better natural selection. And also a good thing, a good point to notice, uh, when we look at all the different modules we have in the JavaScript X system, is the Unix model. So if you take that into account, you see that, for example, when it comes to testing, in Java we have like JUnit, which provides you assertions, which run tests, which does a whole bunch of things. Whilst in JavaScript we have tools that do one thing and they do it well. So Mocha just runs tests and Chai just runs assertions. And there's lots of other pieces you can use in your tests that do one thing and they do it well. So if you want to replace one of them, you can just go and do it because they have a very simple, very specific responsibility. And that decreases complexity because so much complexity in software comes from trying to make one thing do two things. And also, by having smaller pieces, smaller programs, we can write programs that work together so we can add new pieces to the stack of technology we use in an easier way. And all these tools, everything I've been talking about, well, they're not new. NPM, well, that already existed before. It was like Ruby Gems, we had PyPy, we had lots of other package um, repos out there. JSX, well, that's also not a new idea, mixing markup and JavaScript. Well, that already existed like 13 years ago with E4X. Babel, well, the, the compiler principles have been out there for a very long time. You know, if you compare like what Babel does to what other compilers does, well, they're not that different. And these things, you know, like Grunt, NPM, Gulp, Webpack, those task automators, that already existed, I don't know, maybe in 64? And it was called Numake. And in fact, lots of projects in JavaScript still use Numake. We use Numake in Chai, but not because we, we, we want to be hipsters, we want to use like vintage tools. We have bow ties for that, right? So <laughs> we use that because it solves our problem, and it solves our problem in a simple way. So web technologies on uh, mobile that are existed on Symbian, that, uh, that's quite old. So let's see, let's, let's talk a bit how to deal with it. In fact, now that we've seen how all these things happen, now that we kind of like had some philosophy about it. Oh, okay, I, I, uh, I hope everything's good. Uh, <laughs> and the first thing to realize is that you don't need to know everything. You can learn things on demand. You can learn things as you need them to solve your problems because Oh, my controller's not working anymore, sorry. Let's try again. Because every great developer you know got there by solving problems they were unqualified to solve until they actually did it. So when you start learning, start learning from the beginning. Learn, learn JS fundamentals, learn about the HTTP protocol, about HTML, about computer science fundamentals, because, well, uh, that's very important to understand the, the, the basis of what you're working on. You know, and, but don't get too attached to that because it, it may feel like you're trying to learn how to swim by studying dynamic of fluids, and I don't think that's very fun. Don't get too attached to a single technology. So don't be defined by your stack. Don't be too attached to a single tool. Focus on being a good professional, focus on being a good engineer, focus on being good in finding solutions because that's what you're paid for. You're not paid to write code, you're paid to find solutions, you're paid to solve problems. So I've got a very cool anecdote to tell you here. Uh, this gives me chills, uh, I hope it makes you happy too. And it's called Master Fu and the Recruiter. So a technical recruiter, having discovered the ways of Unix hackers were strange to him, sought an audience with Master Fu to learn more about the way. The recruiter said, I have observed that Unix hackers scowl or become annoyed when I ask them how many years of experience they have in a new programming language. 
Why is this so? Master Fu stood and began to pace across the office floor. The recruiter was puzzled and asked, what are you doing? I'm learning to walk, replied Master Fu. I saw you walk through that door, the recruiter exclaimed. And you're not stumbling over your own feet. Obviously, you already know how to walk. Yes, but this floor is new to me, replied Master Fu. Upon hearing this, the audience was enlightened. So whenever you're also trying to learn something, I recommend you to dig deep. This is an advice I got when I was still an intern, and it helped me a lot in many things in my career. So whenever I don't feel like I understand something, I go look at its inner workings. And that's actually how I got started with ChaiJS and open source, because I didn't really understand how it worked. So I went and dig deep, to dig deep into the code and actually see what was happening behind the scenes. So I highly recommend you to do that whenever you really want to understand something. And this also reminds me of a great quote by Richard Feynman, which says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So if you're trying to understand something, maybe try creating a simple version of that yourself. And also, in the very same blackboard, Richard Feynman wrote this phrase. He also wrote, know how to solve every problem that has been solved. So all, like most problems out there, they have already been solved. All you gotta do is read and understand. And if you didn't understand it at first, just read it again, the knowledge is there, right? So whenever you're trying to re-implement something, whenever you're trying to dig deep, focus on what matters, you know? Like avoid bike shedding, don't worry about unnecessary performance uh, constraints or anything like that, just try to understand, try to get things working, try to solve problems. And this is what this talk has been all about so far which is don't get ahead of yourself. So find problems before you actually try to solve them and do small steps. Reduce the number of choices you're gonna make. Don't get ahead of yourself. Build things yourself. And by building things, I don't mean just like following tutorials because sometimes tutorials create abstractions just, just to show you how things work. And sometimes what you really need is to see the use case of, of what you're trying to learn, right? instead of just creating an artificial situation for that to appear. Because first, you learn the value of abstraction, and then you learn the cost of abstraction. And only then, you're ready to engineer. And this is why I think you should try to build things yourself and find use, case, use cases for things yourself. And don't be afraid to do things that don't scale. Right? You're paid to solve problems. And premature optimization is indeed the root of all evil. And since we love comparison, since we love saying we're software engineers, that's what's written on my badge. Um, well, are we really software engineers? Like, is engineering an accurate term to describe what we do? Like, how often do we see bridges falling down and how often do we see apps uh, crashing? Right? So we've been doing engineering for, I don't know, like many, many years and We've only been writing software, I don't know, maybe for seven years or something. So as you can see, maybe engineers is not the right term to describe like our profession, right? And I got a very good analogy here. Uh, it's from a book by Sun Newman about microservices. I highly recommend you to read it, by the way. Uh, so this right here is the city of Barcelona, right? When you look at, the, at it this way, you know, just looks like a mess, maybe like some software out there. Um, but this is Barcelona as seen from the sky. As you can see, it's very organized, its blocks are very well defined. And by the time, like Gaudi and the other architects were planning it, they could not predict what the city was gonna be like. So they had to make it grow organically, they had to kind of organize it as, they, as, they, as time goes by. So I think that maybe we should try to do the same as they've done with Barcelona, what we do with our software. Maybe we should be town planners instead of engineers, right? Because software is flexible, engineering is not, and our build time is compile time. So maybe we should just let our software grow and adapt as needed, solve problems one at a time, and let the right situations for abstractions appear before we start 
actually trying to use them because abstractions only work well in the right context. And the right context develops as the system develops. This is uh, another very good advice I got from a friend when I was struggling with some uh, Vim comments, which is my choice, I love it, um, which is strive to be lazy. So when you're doing things repetitively, when you feel like you're struggling too much to get a simple thing done, maybe that's because you're not striving to be lazy, right? Always try to have the less amount of work possible. So when you try to strive to be lazy, maybe sometimes you won't realize that you can do things in a better way, which is why it's so important to talk to people, which is why it's, I think it's so important to come to conferences. Because here, sometimes you might realize you're not doing things the, more, the most efficient way possible. But in the end, I think the most important thing is to be curious. Read widely, try new things, because what most people call intelligence just boils down to curiosity. But if I had to like sum this whole talk up in like a single, a single advice, it would be to solve problems. Because software is not this magical thing that makes us programmers happy. You know, I'd, like it's amazing to write recursive algorithms, work with like cool data structures, big data and all that stuff. But in the end, we got to solve someone's problems. And well, that's basically it. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for being here today. And I hope you liked it. Um, I hope you liked the jokes. Here's a few links. I'll put this up online in a few minutes after this talk, I hope. So you can get everything there. And well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We actually had one question that I think you could answer really quickly, which was what's bike shedding? So that's a very good question. Cool. So basically, uh, bike shedding was when you lose too much time discussing about um, stuff that's unnecessary, like tubs versus spaces. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, this, 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 the history of the, this term is quite interesting. So, when you try to build a nuclear power plant, for example, so that's a very complicated thing. I think we can all agree on that, right? So, when people go to build um, a nuclear power plant, everyone will argue about what color the bike shed is going to be like, about like how it's going to be like, because the bike shed is something simple. Everyone can like just go there and give an opinion on it. Whilst when you're building a nuclear power plant, people assume that people doing it are smart, so they just assume everything's gonna go right. Mm -hmm. So they waste a lot more time discussing about the bike shed than the actual nuclear, nuclear power plant. Uh, that's your daily dose of unuseful culture for today. <laughs> that's fantastic. Does anyone here use Hangouts still? I do. Okay, so if you type forward slash bike shed, It'll start changing the colors in the background. It's pretty use great. spaces, not tabs. Yeah. And definitely use spaces, not tabs. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you.